Good morning, Rock of Roseville. Man, what a, what a great day it, it has been, and uh, uh, just an amazing time of, of worship and um, and just being able to to connect with people. Isn't this isn't this great to be connected in the body of Christ? Like, wasn't this a good idea that God had <laughs> for us? <laughs> And so, um, so welcome to each of you. Uh, good to see you guys and those of you tuning in online. Um, this is uh, this is going to be a good day. This is going to be a good day. Uh, as we are um, concluding this series called "Moving Forward," or how to get how to get unstuck, right? How do how do you, what do you, what do you do when you're stuck? How do you move forward? What what needs to happen? What needs to shift? We've been in this for a few weeks now. We're going to going to conclude today, and um, and the thing I want to I want to focus on, um, probably no surprise to any of you if you've heard me before, is our heart. <laughs> I want to talk about our heart. Let me let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because um, I do a lot of coaching, and I, I've been coaching leaders for for 19 years. Um, it started off when I was a chaplain in the Air Force and, um, and advising and military commanders. And so they'd come in and talk about leadership decisions that they have and, um, and, and areas where they were stuck. Um, and then working with pastors and, and other nonprofit leaders. But ultimately, ultimately, um, it, it's that feeling of being stuck that causes people to say, I need some help. Usually. Usually, they're stuck somewhere. They don't know what it is. And you've probably heard the phrase, like a glass ceiling, right? You feel like you can't move up, but you can't see what it is that, that you keep bumping into when you want to grow, when you want to advance, when you want to improve that, that glass ceiling. Um, and one of the things that, um, that, you know, we've seen in movie scenes is the, the, the seemingly hopeless situation of finding yourself in quicksand. It's like the worst thing ever. I mean, the, the whole scene shifts when a person goes, ah, I'm in quicksand. You're like, oh, that's not good. Because we know that it's, it has reputation for taking you down. It has a reputation for you not being able to get out. And certainly the trauma of discovering that you are in quicksand, it causes you to not see opportunities for how you can get out because you're so focused on how stuck you are. And what I've learned in, in coaching conversations and what I've learned in, uh, even in my own life is that part of getting unstuck when I am stuck is seeing something I haven't seen and believing something I haven't believed. You have to see what you don't see. Then after you see it, you have to believe what you don't believe. And then you can move. When we're stuck, usually it's because there's an issue in step one. We don't see something. Right? And we can, we can call that blind spots. Oftentimes, I help, help leaders with, with, with blind spots. And I've learned to, to go in that direction because of how helpful it was for me to be helped with my blind spots. An area of my life where I consistently have an inaccurate view of reality. That's a blind spot. I, no matter, I, I have been with myself as long as I can remember like, I'm not, like, there's no one else on the planet that is more of an expert on John Harris than myself. But yet, there are things that other people can teach me about myself that I don't know. Isn't that crazy? And, and as a matter of fact, because I have the PhD in me, and you don't, it's easy for me to disregard what you say about me because I'm going to assume that my perception is right and your perception is wrong. And so I can end up getting stuck because there's something I cannot see about me. And because I don't see it about me, I certainly don't believe it about me. 
Uh, here, here's the thing about blind spots is that it doesn't, it, it's not something that you should take personal. We all have blind spots. It's like a car. It doesn't reflect on the quality of a car to have a blind spot. All car, cars are made with blind spots. I mean, at least the cars we have now. I mean, in the future, there might be something else going on. I don't know. Right, and usually you have to have someone in that passenger seat when you get to that intersection and you can't see where you want to see. Someone in the intersection, I mean, in the passenger seat, you ask them, say, am I clear? Am I, am I good to go? And you have to trust that what they're saying is true because you don't want to die. Right? And you got to trust that they don't want you to die. But when they say it's clear that you can go, then you can go. But you're asking for somebody to help you see something that you cannot see on your own. Now, obviously, if you're driving the car by yourself, you got to do some maneuvering, right? You got to move around. You, you're trying to do something because it's to see in that blind spot. Maybe you've been driving down the road and you, you thought the lane was clear. You began to move over and somebody's horn said, hey, this is not clear. You didn't see them because they were in your blind spot. And you almost had an accident unless that person communicated to you, I'm here, although you didn't see me. When, when we think about getting unstuck, there's something that we don't see and when we don't see it we don't believe it and when we don't believe it we cannot move when we look at at scripture we see this whole thing being played out because when God sees us in our sin he knows we can't get out we're stuck we cannot get out but he knows we will not get out unless he helps us see And when we see, he helps us believe. And when we believe, then we are saved. One of the interesting things in Isaiah chapter 6, this scripture is not on the board. I didn't think about it till this morning. Um, Isaiah chapter 6, uh, the, you know, Isaiah has this, big, he has this vision of God coming into the temple and the, and the train of his robe fill the temple. He has this experience with the holiness of God. He says, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord and the train of his robe filled the temple. The train is like, you know, like a wedding dress, a long, long train, right? The train of his robe filled the temple. And the Hebrew word filled means it, kept, it just kept on coming in. It kept on filling. It just kept on coming in. Train of uh, above him were the six winged angels singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. And Isaiah said, I looked at that. And when I looked at that, I saw me. When I saw what real holiness is, I saw that I was not holy. Until I saw true holiness, I thought I was amazing. And when I really saw amazing, I realized I was not that. <laughs> what was Isaiah's response? He said, woe is me. I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Now, after Isaiah says this, a seraphim, a six-winged angel, took a coal from the altar and put it on his mouth and said, your sins have been forgiven and you've been purged. That forgiveness, that purging didn't happen until Isaiah saw. But here's where things get interesting. Isaiah didn't just see with his eyes. He saw with his heart. That's where the transformation happened. Many of us were so used to being in this culture of rationale and logic and everything must make sense, must make sense. That's why we struggle in our walk with God because he doesn't make sense and he's not trying to. He's not trying to make sense, he's trying to make faith. And so he doesn't do things the way you want. He doesn't do things the way you expect. He wants you to hear him. He wants you to follow him. He wants you to obey him. Because on the journey, he changes you. He's making you more and more like his son. He is more concerned about transformation than he is education. So he doesn't just tell us stuff. He wants us to discover stuff. 
If he tells us, it's information, and we can easily reject it. But if we discover it, it impacts us differently. That's why someone can tell you something, you're like, I don't know about that. But then let you have a dream about it, where there's images and pictures. And then you see that you, you learn the interpretation of that dream, and that discovery of the very same thing hits you differently. As a matter of fact, I'm going to solve a mystery today for many of you. How many of you, you have been trying to talk to somebody, you've experienced this, you've been trying to tell somebody something over and over and over, maybe even for years, and they don't listen. They don't listen. And then, Mr. or Mrs. Special Human Being over here <laughs> tells them the very same thing. Look, you even said it better. But when this person said it, maybe even a complete stranger said it. That individual you've been trying to help acted like the, the heavens parted, light came down, an angel spoke, and now they got it. You want to know why? I'll tell you why. Because when you were talking to them, they were listening with their mind. That's why they had a debate. That's why it was a debate. That's why they rejected what you said. Because of the nature, watch this, because of the nature of the relationship, their heart was closed to it coming from you. They thought you had an agenda. They thought you're trying to be, to control them. They thought all this, so they had these defenses up. But this stranger, who seems to be a bit more objective, their heart was open to receive from them, and they said the exact same thing. And that person was like, oh. That's the difference when you receive something with your heart. And the thing is that in our walk with God, some of us are only listening with our minds. And he has to tell us over and over and over and over, and we just don't get it. Huh? So you think that was frustrating for you? <laughs> doom, 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 doom. Right? You think it's frustrating for you? No, yeah, God knows how you feel. <laughs> and so he doesn't come to educate our mind. Matter of fact, you take the whole Bible. The Bible. You can read the entire Bible front to end. You can, you can have memorized the table of contents and the maps in the back. You can have memorized the whole thing and, and still not meet God. On the other hand, with a heart that is open, you can randomly open it, and one verse pops off the page, grabs your heart, and you have a new life. <laughs> the heart, the heart. If you are stuck in any area of your life, there's an area of your heart where you're stuck. You don't need more information. You don't need a new argument. You don't need rationale. There's something in your heart. We are used to hearing about mental disorders, but we don't hear anything about heart disorders. See, the Bible talks about sin, and sin actually comes from heart disorders. So when you're stuck, man. People can argue with you about stuff all day. Won't matter. Won't matter. So listen, save yourself some time. Don't argue with people. Sometimes people just are not ready. There are people who wanted to argue with Jesus. Jesus did not argue with them. He knew in their hearts that they were not ready. There's no point in carrying on this conversation any further. He either won't receive me and the message, now or ever, so it could be a matter of time, it could be a matter of you hearing it from somebody else, but I'm not going to argue because your heart is closed and your mind is just wide open. That's why you're confused. You think the solution is more information. It's not. It's a revelation. Something needs to be revealed so that you can see and believe and move. And so when you see this scene with Isaiah, he's, 
he, he is transformed, right? He goes from feeling completely unworthy. His sins get forgiven in that moment. And then, he, and then and it's like God scratching his head, asking Isaiah this rhetorical question. Hmm, you know, we have a mission. We're trying to figure out who should we send and who should go for us. And Isaiah goes from, woe is me. I am undone and full of sin and I'm horrible. He goes from that to, I'll go. Where'd your confidence come from, Isaiah? What makes you think God, like you, you were just the most horrible person in the world. Like you, you just saw that about yourself. Where did your confidence come from? Something about being forgiven by God changes you. He's changed right here. He's like, man, I, man, I, I, I live among people who are like horrible. And I know if I, man, if I see this about myself, and I'm changed. And the, the people I'm around, they need to be changed. God, I'll go. Send me. I will go. So they can experience the same thing I just experienced. Send me. I will go. I'll go. His heart was different. And so you see in the ministry of Jesus, when Jesus comes into the world, when he comes and he knows we're trying to get, we, ultimately we got to get unstuck out of the whole sin thing. We got to get unstuck. And how does Jesus, the master teacher, how does he teach? He doesn't just roll them all people and go, hey, I'm the son of God. Let's just clear up this whole, instead of this three-year ministry, just listen to what I'm telling you. I'm the Messiah. I'm the son of God. Follow me or you're going to die. <laughs> he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Instead, he comes to the woman at the well and says, hey, give me something to drink. Well, you don't, you don't even have a jar. Well, if you knew who you was asking, you'd be asking me for, for water. And whoever has the water that I have to give will never thirst again. She's like, well, well what, what, what do you mean what kind of water you have to give? Well, if you got some water, well, I have to keep on coming out here every single day to get water. Then give me some of that water. He's like, yes. Yeah, see. <laughs> got her. <laughs> Longest conversation recorded in the Bible that Jesus had with anyone, and it was a woman he was not supposed to talk to. And the reason why the conversation took so long is because he didn't come out and tell her I'm the Messiah. He wanted her to discover it so that she would receive it as truth in her heart. She was initially stuck with the whole mind thing. Right? Jesus, give me some water. Okay, first of all, mind. Does that make sense? I'm a woman. You're a Jew. I'm, I'm, I'm a woman. You're a man. Or a Jewish man. We're not supposed to be talking. I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. We're not supposed to be talking. I'm by myself. You're by yourself. We're not supposed to be talking. Like, and you want water. Well, who comes to a well with water for water and you don't even have a drop? Like, this doesn't make sense. And so he draws her. Watch this. He draws her out of her head into her heart. And so, so he goes, yeah, I don't have no, no, no jar. But uh, if you knew who you're talking to, you'd be asking me for water instead of where's my jar. Well, who am I talking to then? I'll tell you what you do. Tell you what I want you to do. Why don't you go, go back to the city and go get your husband? I don't have a husband. I know. I see. This, this lady's like, see, this is why they tell us not to talk to these Jewish men. <laughs> this right here. This joker is crazy. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands. And the person that you live with now is not your husband. She goes, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> really good. Really good. Like, she is sharp. Perceive does not come from the mind. When Jesus reveals supernatural knowledge about her that she knows, logically, he's not supposed to know. She shifts from her head to her heart. I per perceiving happens here. Discerning happens here. This whole situation seems wrong, Mr. Strange Jewish man, but I perceive that right now God is doing something. God must have sent you. You are a man of God. I perceive that you're a prophet. And then she says this. She asks a question about worship. You Jews worship in Jerusalem, but, but we, Samaritan, we worship on, on, on this mountain. Where, where's the right place to worship? And Jesus goes into more detail. He says, well, let's, let me tell you something. The time is coming and now is where the true worshipers of God will worship him in spirit and in truth. It won't be about a place. It'll be about what's inside. The Father is looking for those to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then she says, okay, this is getting interesting, right? 
we've heard that there is a Messiah coming, she says. And he goes, you got me. It's your boy. It's right. It's me. I'm talking to you right now. Jesus, why take her through that whole thing? Look at the outcome. She runs to the city. You guys got to come see this man who told me everything I've ever done. And these people are looking at a whole new woman. She's transformed. Why? Because she discovered with her heart. And she got unstuck. Watch this, though. When she got unstuck, she helped people around her. See, you can't pull people out of a pit that you're in as well. She got unstuck because she saw something. And Jesus does the same thing with you and with me. Matter of fact, one of the things that Proverbs says, look at Proverbs 3. We quote this all the time. We quote it all the time. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. This, this is what it says. Trust in the Lord with all your what? And do not rely on your what? Okay. In all your ways, right? Acknowledge him. Know him. And he'll make your path straight. Look, look at what? Okay, okay. Trust him with your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. That, that's the beginning. What is the result? You'll know him in everything. And he'll guide your path. He will guide you in your heart, not your mind. He just said your mind will trip you up. Don't rely on things that make sense to your head. Your head has issues. You don't think right all the time. So don't expect God to come into your craziness and try to bring truth. No, no, no. Because you can receive things with your heart that totally blow your mind. Watch this. Like if you keep your mind perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him, like how does, how does that happen? How does it happen? Because he'll give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. If it surpasses all understanding, then where did you receive it? In your heart. This is how we can have a peace in the midst of a storm. Right? It doesn't make sense for Jesus to be sleeping in a storm. Look, you can be sleeping in the same storm too. You can be sleeping in a storm. Right? All hell is breaking loose and you are calm and, and, and collected. And people are like, well, why are you calm? Because this doesn't make sense because you have a peace that surpasses all understanding. How does it happen? You've learned. You've learned some things about God. You learn how to trust him with your heart. When you trust him with your heart, your heart doesn't go off to the races every time something goes crazy. You've learned some things about God in your heart. You've learned about his faithfulness. You've learned about his provision. You've learned about his character. You've learned that you can trust him with the very core of who you are. You've learned it. And as you've learned it in your heart, it has changed you. It has transformed you. And you are a different person. And so our entire walk with God is about getting out of one stuck place. And getting unstuck. Getting unstuck. Getting unstuck. Seeing new things about God and believing new things about God. Seeing new things about ourselves. And believing these new things about ourselves, including our strengths, including our weaknesses. One of the things that, 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 that God had to do with Isaiah, like God already saw Isaiah's sin. The problem was Isaiah didn't see it, so he didn't think there needed to be anything dealt with. Only when Isaiah saw his sin, it was in his blind spot. What was me? I'm undone. Isaiah, you were undone before you got into the temple. The only thing that was different was now he sees it. Now when he sees it, something changes in his heart. He's a different guy. When you are stuck, there is something you do not see. Now here's the deal. Here's the deal. It doesn't mean that, um, 
that there is a completely brand new truth that you have never heard of before, because sometimes that's what we think is going to get us, right? Something I've never heard of before is going to get me. No, it, it might be the same thing you've been hearing. But you've been refusing it because your heart is closed. Guys, anytime you're stuck, your heart is closed in an area that it needs to be open. So sometimes it's not about hearing or a new truth. Sometimes it's about seeing an old truth in a new way. Seeing an old truth in a new way. I remember when I stepped down from my full-time job at a church in, uh, in Fairfield, I was at Liberty Church in Fairfield, and I stepped down from that to, go, to do ministry full-time as far as consulting and things like that. I really felt like there was a shift happening with me when I wanted to come out of one church context and help multi, you know, be freed up to help more churches. But what I wasn't realizing at that moment is how much uh, trust in God I was going to have to have in this new season that I hadn't had to have before. Prior to that, I was in the Air Force for nine years. So when it comes to finances, I was good. Right? Every 1st and 15th, I don't have to worry about it. Hear me. I didn't feel like I needed to trust God for it. Now, if you would ask me if I'm trusting God, I'm not sure. Like, I know the Sunday school answer, right? I know the vacation Bible school answer. Does God provide you? Oh, yeah, God provide me my job in the Air Force. Like, I would have said that. But I did not know that I didn't really believe that. Hear what I'm telling you. So then I went into the, the, the uh, service at the church. I was at this church for, for nine years. When I stepped down from that to go full time, I'm like, okay, God, here we go. All right? Like, I know you're able. I know you're provider. I know this and that. But, but then when the opportunities weren't really opening up, I'm like, okay, God, uh, now we got, uh, you know, we got the wife and we got the three kids. And, uh, like, if I was just by myself and, and I had hard times, I got no friend. I could, I could lay up in somebody's room, you know, in the, in the attic, you know, if I'm just by myself. But I got the wife and the kids. Like, wait, what, we need to, what's, what's, what's the next step here? What's the, what's, the, what's the next thing here? I didn't hear anything. I said, no, God, for real. Okay, uh. Like, like okay, God, okay, quit playing, Jesus, quit playing. Um. <laughs> No, for real. Like I know you told me to step down, but what's 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 up though? What what what? what cause you know, cause we like to eat and we like to to live in a house and wear clothes. So where is the provision going to come from? Things are are different, and it's in this particular season of transition. I saw that topic for the women's breakfast coming up. Right, the season of transition. And I began to reflect on some messages that I had taught other people <laughs> about how you can trust God to provide for you in seasons of transition. And I talked about Elijah in a particular message, how God was providing for Elijah through a brook, right? And the ravens that came to feed Elijah food, and he had a brook. And then after that, then he moved Elijah to a, a city called Zarephath and said, I'm going to provide for you using this widow. And so the, the method of provision changed, but the source of the provision never did. It was always God. And it wasn't until this season in my life that I realized in my head, I believe that, you know, yeah, yeah, God provides. Yeah, God provides. But in my heart, I didn't make the connection that God had provided the Air Force, that God had provided my job at Liberty, and that God would continue to provide in whatever the next step was. It was, it was when I didn't have the, the 9 to 5 and the constant uh, 1st and 15th payment every month that I realized that I hadn't seen him as provider here. I, if you would have asked me, I would have told you, right? I, I'm, I'm a pastor. I know the answers. But my life and the condition of my heart and the degree to which anxiety began to be a good friend of mine revealed, woe is me, I'm undone. I don't have the faith I, I thought I had and I don't have the faith I've been telling y'all to have. I didn't realize 
that in my heart I haven't had to trust him like I have to trust him right now. And on one of my little walk and talks that I do with God, this is when he said, he said, he said, John, I am a providing father. And because you didn't see these other sources, these other methods of provision as coming from me, now you're acting like we're starting brand new. Because I was stuck in anxiety, concern, this and that, and I was stuck. I was like, man, and that's not something I want to tell anybody, right? I'm, I'm, I'm Dr. John. <laughs> Listen, I, tr- I promise you, God does not call me Dr. John. <laughs> He calls me son. And that's more valuable and more important. And I had to earn the doctorate. Had to pay for that one. It sounds cool. But son is here. Son is identity. And when the father talks to you as his son or as his daughter, his voice will speak to your heart. He's not going to answer all your questions. You think that will help, but it won't. It'll satisfy the curiosities of your mind, but more information does not get you unstuck. Opening your heart to what God wants to say to you is what will get you unstuck. Opening your heart to what God wants to say to you is what will help reveal what's in your blind spot. Spiritual blind spot, emotional blind spot, relational blind spot, whatever it is, he knows the answer and he'll speak it to your heart. And he might say something to you that you've heard before. Doesn't matter if you heard it before, if you never received it before. Doesn't matter if you have heard it before, if you haven't believed it before. It's when you see and then you believe, that's when you can move. When you see it and you believe it, that's when you can move. And so for me, the father, my walk of talk, he began to help me see that I didn't trust him as provider. I, here's the thing. I knew him as healer. I've seen all kind of crazy miracles. I, I, I've seen, like, I, know, I know him as as healer. I know, I, I know him as, as the giver of gifts. I use the gift every single time I, I speak and, and, and share. It's a teaching gift that he's given me to serve the body. I, I know that about him, but I haven't had to see this part about him the way I do now. So for him to reveal himself to me as provider, he had to help me see that I wasn't already there. And when I saw that man, my Air Force career, I didn't see it as him providing. Because I, matter of, as you know, I went and got the Masters of, of Divinity degree. I applied to be a chaplain. I got accepted to be a chaplain. There are so many things that I did. I, listen, I would have told you, oh, to God be the glory. He gets all the glory. But in my heart, I still felt like I earned it. Because I felt like I earned it. I earned that position. I earned all these kind of things, right? And my resume and all that. I, I earned it. I didn't really see it as him providing for me. And in my job at the church, I didn't really see it as him providing for me. So I had to see that I did not see. And when I saw that I did not see him as provider, and that and I definitely now need to see him as provider. He asked me, do you believe I will take care of you and your family? He says, you are my son. They're also my children. Don't think you've got more love for them than I do. Do you believe I am provider? I say, yeah, yeah, okay, 
I'm going to need something from you I've never needed before. I'm going to need something from you and believe something for you I, I, I haven't had to believe before. It was always there. He was still faithful, whether I gave him credit or not. But now I need to see this in a different way. And when I saw it, then I believed it. And then when I believed it, then I got unstuck. And now I can tell you I can tell you the whole journey. I don't care. There's no shame in it. I don't care. Right? I didn't believe God, okay? <laughs> Doesn't matter. What matters is I believe him now. I believe him now. I have a, a, a program I'm, I'm creating for, for, um, for, pa for pastors. And somebody from, this long story, I'm just shorting it as we close. Uh, somebody from New Zealand wanted to interview me about um, about church abuse, right? As a matter of fact, somebody from this from this area, I think from this church, was in a group with this person, okay, a Facebook group, and this person who has this TV show online in international uh, said, "Does anyone know anybody who can help with people recovering from church abuse, or even help pastors who who are the offenders but need help to so they can stop it?" And this person tagged me in that post. I saw the post. I said, hey, yeah, I'll be happy to talk to you about this. And definitely it's one of those areas. It's a, it's a good area. I'll be happy to talk to you. So she, she, we connect on Zoom. She's in New Zealand. We connect on Zoom. We're talking on Zoom. And in my mind, for the past few weeks, I'm like, okay, how do I get this program out? I don't know a ton of pastors. I don't know. How do I get this program? If I can help pastors, I can help churches. If I can help churches, I can help communities. Like, I'm trying to think of all this. How do I get, the, how do I get it out, right? So on this conversation, we're talking, we're talking, we're talking. Long story short, she goes, and I, I share with her how I coach pastors and overcome blind spots. And sometimes the church abuse thing is a blind spot for pastors. And they're not trying to be evil. Some of them, it's just dysfunction. And they got to see it, then believe it, then they can move, right? She goes, you know what? Um, she asked me about more about the coaching program. I'll put up some graphics on my computer. This is what I do. And this is the nine steps, right? The nine steps, right? She says, she says, you know what? Let's not do the church abuse thing. Um, I want to interview you. It's a full 30 minutes on your coaching program. And at the end of that, our, our, the, the, the show, you can do your, your pitch and invite, invite pastor to be part of your coaching program. You mean on your international TV show podcast? She's like, yeah. Do you believe I will provide for you? Yes. I believe. Guys, I couldn't have sat down and go, you know what? I think the best thing for me to do is try to try to connect with somebody in New Zealand. I, I don't. Are you understand? That's not my plan. Are you what I'm telling you? That's not my plan. That's not my plan. Hey, I'm trying to figure out how to get people in. And now I'm going to be talking about this program to people, pastors all over the world. You see it, you believe, then you can move. I didn't see it in my heart. I didn't see him as provider. I do now. And now I feel like the cold has touched my lips. Heart is different. And I preached about God being provider before, but I preached about it different now. It's one thing to share something from inspiration. It's a whole other thing to share it from a reality. When you share the reality of who Christ is to you, what he's done for you, that's what changes people. And Jesus knew that. That's why he told stories all the time. That's why he told parables all the time. So people would see themselves in the story. That they would discover truth because he's trying to transform them, not educate them. That's what teaching really does. It changes who you are. And when you are changed at the core of who you are, you can't undo that. When a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, it cannot go back to being a caterpillar. Nor does it have a craving. I miss those days I had all those legs. 
I used to crawl in the branches and eat leaves all day. I just miss it. Like I just, or, or the, or the butterfly de- never goes, you know what? I'm feeling that caterpillar tendency again. I feel like I'm about to backslide. I'm about to go back to who I used to be. No. When you're changed, there's no going back. When you're changed. I'll make this last statement, then we're done. One of the most misleading things I see in Hollywood is the Transformers. Can you guess why? Because every time they change, they go right back. That's not what it means to be transformed. When God transforms you, you don't go back. You don't go back. If there's an area where you do feel like you're still going back, that's okay. There's no condemnation. You're not transformed yet. You may have grown. You may have improved. But it's not complete transformation. Complete transformation is, I forgot I even used to do that. All right, let's all stand.